using my skill set to provide value to someone else has opened up doors that I never dreamed could be opened with any amount of money. And this is what I think when it comes to the, like, you know, the reaching the unreachable, I don't think it can be just to reach them. I think there's got to be some higher purpose. Like, you know, there's got to be some reason, some affinity, some common ground, some mutual benefit far above and beyond what, what there typically is. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Community Made Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaynard. So far this season of the podcast on how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships, we've talked about why deep and authentic relationships are not only critical to your professional success, but science has shown it's the key driver for mental health, happiness, and longevity. Why great events and live experiences can be the ultimate unfair advantage when you're a high-growth-minded entrepreneur because they deliver on one of our most valuable assets, speed the speed of growth the speed of wisdom and the speed of relationships and i shared a playbook on how to foster deep and genuine relationships with people at conferences and networking events even if you're an introvert in today's episode we're going to shift gears a little bit i'm going to tackle a pretty common question that i get which is how do you get your foot in the door and connect with folks who are quote unquote big names with that said, I thought sharing the following clip from the wildly popular Art of Charm podcast would be a great place to start. One of the things I always told my clients is, you know, I can get you a no very fast. <laughs> a yes, I can't tell you how long it's going to take. So when I sort of set my targets on meeting someone, I'm able to sort of find the path usually to get me into it. Our friend Jason did a good job of that. I mean, he he put it up everywhere. I don't know if he told you how he finally got connected to you. No. It was he was asking, "Hey, has anyone seen this? Has anyone seen the Supermensch thing? Does anybody know Chef Gordon?" And it was on a little private community that we have for events he uh -huh. set up. And then he just kept asking, and finally someone said, "I think I know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody." And he got introduced to you, and then he, to my knowledge, lived in your house for three days. <laughs> yeah, no, he, he's actually, that's so funny, I never thought about it, but he actually is a perfect example of um, those things I talked about. You know, luck, chutzpah, being a little bit of a groupie. Jason, I, I, for those of you who don't know, Jason is this wonderful guy, lives in Canada, who runs a thing called Masterminds. Right, Mastermind Talks, yeah. yeah. And I never go on Facebook. I yeah, know. I know, I added you and I thought, oh. Yeah. No. I almost never go yeah. on Facebook. I've started to now about Jason's insistence. Yes. I don't remember if it was my secretary. Somebody highlighted to me an email from Jason. And I read it and I said, boy, this sounds really interesting. And I didn't answer it. And then he, I, another one came in. And I said, this is really, you know, this is different than the others. What he was able in a very aloha way to hit on things that he knew would get my attention. He said, um, you have a book coming out. Um, I'd love to help you promote the book. I don't know if, if you care or not, but if you care about how it does, I, I think I can be useful. Yeah. Um, and that hit a note with me because I don't have a manager. Yeah, I, I guess that makes yeah. sense. Why would you? Right? <laughs> and I know how much work it takes, you know, to get above the noise for anything. Oh, Especially now. Yeah, amazing. So I answered him, which I rarely do. And every one of his answers was so honest and um, full of aloha and intelligence. When you say full of aloha, do you just mean, is that like a, a synonym for humility in some uh, ways? Was, yeah, humility, um, a, a concept of innocence, win-win, a thankfulness. He was very confident of what he did, but didn't push it. You know, just a beautiful approach. Yeah. Um, and um, one thing led to another. We started talking on the phone. He said to me, uh, I have some free time. Um, could I come out and see you? And... Uh, that was sort of an overwhelm. I said, you're kidding, you really would do that? And he said, yes. And he came out and we spent three days together. And I sent him back a note after the three days. And I said, you know, if I had a uh, birth son, I'd sure like him to be like you. Wow. And in the end, it serves him well. It's a beautiful win-win. Oh, yeah. it's, sure. it's what I try and do. I talk in the book about how you, you try and make things a win-win situation. So for me, he's given me a viewpoint on how to get this book to people to read. Yes. He does these conferences. I can't wait to go to one of his conferences. I mean, well, I, I'll I'd see like, you there. Yeah, I'd like yeah. crawl to get to the conference now. And that's a win-win.
Now, in full transparency, I didn't play that clip to impress you. I, I played it to impress upon you that what I'm about to share with you in this episode is not based in theory. These are approaches that I've refined over the years, and I really want to lay out the entire playbook for you. Now, for listeners who aren't familiar with Shep, he is one of the most well-connected and influential figures in film, music, and the culinary arts. I mean, in, in culinary specifically, he created the whole celebrity chef movement, managing the careers of Wolfgang Puck and Emeril Lagasse. And I mean, the chefs that you see on TV today really can credit Shep for kickstarting that whole industry. You'll actually hear his entire story, which is fascinating, in the next episode when we share an exclusive Q&A that he actually ended up doing at one of our MMT Live experiences. But like he said in this interview with Jordan, I was able to connect with him uh, with a little bit of luck, a little bit, I guess, a spot, like he said, and a genuine desire to contribute to his life and his work in a positive way. Connecting with big names is more of an art than a science. And in today's episode, I'm going to walk you through three real life examples of reaching the unreachable and, and break down the philosophies and the strategies that each of these people use to make those connections finally happen. And if you listen carefully, you'll discover ways to cut through the noise, how to work with gatekeepers and turning rejection into opportunity. So let's get started. The first story I want to share is of a very good friend of mine, Michael Gebbin. Prior to meeting Michael, he was a small-time videographer, wedding videographer specifically, based in an itty-bitty town called Alton, Illinois. Michael and I connected over dinner at Tim Ferriss' opening the Kimono event back in 2011, which is an event I've made mention of several times. And he was there to capture the magic of the two-day experience. Michael has, through sheer tenacity and no strings attached really approach managed to work with some of the biggest thought leaders in business and personal development. And I'm going to let Michael share his story on how he, again, a small time videographer ended up in New York city to work alongside award-winning angel investor and five time New York times bestselling author, Tim Ferriss. It started with a local company in St. Louis, Missouri that held a Halloween party every year where they had all the local agencies come. And there was like I don't know, three to 500 people that would show up every year to these parties. And I reached out and offered to do um, their event for free. They said yes. And that alone led to over 80 to $100,000 worth of work doing that free video for that company, which they were the ones who led to the 80 to $100,000 worth of work. But that video, I saw uh, a blog post from Tim Ferriss that essentially uh, was announcing the launch party for the four hour body. And it was $10 to go. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> 10 bucks. Cause I saw earlier on the blog that his first one for the four hour work week was free. Well, when I saw it was for 10, I was like, oh my gosh, I gobbled up a ticket immediately, but I actually didn't know if I was gonna go cause I live in Illinois, it was in New York city. You know, at the time, I mean, costs of flights and hotel, New York's not cheap. You know, I didn't know if I was really gonna go, but then I saw a comment in the, uh, uh, on the blog in the comment section where somebody asked if they could get a refund cause they saw that it was 21 and older. And Tim actually replied and said, just email charlie at the fourhourbody.com and he'll get you taken care of. And something came over me when I read that, that I thought, you know what? What's the worst thing that's gonna happen? I, I, I say this now, the worst thing that's gonna happen is you get a no and you get a no when you don't ask or you don't try. At least when you try, there is an opportunity for something good to happen. And so I thought, you know what? I'll just send Charlie an email saying, you know what, Tim's book has really made a huge impact on my life. And um, I have this skill set of video and I sent them the Halloween party that I did for free. And I said, I'd love to do this for Tim and, and, the, uh, and the launch party. If you want it, fantastic. If you don't, that's fine too. Just let me know. So I'm not that guy like coming in with my cameras, just going to do it. Uh, without permission or anything. I was just like, either way, no harm, no foul. I'm excited. I'm going to be there anyways, which I honestly didn't know if I was going to, but that's what I said. And I believe wholeheartedly that a lot in life is timing. I mean, you have to take that chance. You have to send that email, make that phone call, send that message, whatever it is. But there's so much timing that goes into it as well. And so they were in the middle of getting emails for refunds and other things like that. And so when that email came through, it was the right time. I got an email back from Charlie an hour later um, saying, 
Tim loves it. Sounds great. We'd love to have you. It's going to be free, right? <laughs> I said, absolutely. I didn't know what that was going to really do for my life uh, doing that. In fact, what I found and what will be the thread here moving forward is that when I've reached out to people like Tim Ferriss and Tony Robbins and all these other people that I've been able to connect with, I say unconditionally, I didn't want anything in return and I just wanted to provide them value because in my mind, they already provided me value. Tim's book is what he gave to me and I wanted to give back to him with the skill set that I had. Well, that launch party shoot went so well that Michael ended up working for Tim to capture several more events and live experiences, which turned into some paid engagements and ultimately led him to working with another one of my friends, Yannick Silver, for his event, The Underground, who then brought Michael to Necker Island, where he had the opportunity to film some stuff for Richard Branson, and that turned into the opportunity to do several more projects for Richard. But Michael didn't stop there. Then it was in December of 2011 that I decided to, I actually saw you, Jason, I don't know if you know this, but I essentially saw you post that you and Candace went to a date with Destiny. I don't know, it was something like $14,000 for the two of you. And I thought, I saw it a very much scarcity mindset. I was like, oh my God. I was like, that is never gonna happen. I'll do what I did for Tim. And I, I thought I'll send an email. So I tried to look up Tony Robbins' personal email address. I couldn't find any. I found a few at Tony Robbins emails. I emailed them, kind of a similar spiel, but I you know, included the Tim Ferriss piece. And I said, I, I did, it, Tony's had a huge impact. Uh, if I can provide value, here's what I do. I would love to make a video for you guys. And lo and behold, one of the emails was the head of security. And he emailed me back within a week and said, we'll email, oh, forward this to marketing. If they like it, they'll get back to you. If not, good luck. And that was it. By March, April of 2012, I was jumping on a helicopter, flying over New York City with Tony and Sage and landing at the, the Meadowlands and walked behind Tony onto a stage of 6,000 people in the audience. And I was overwhelmed with emotion because the most people I was ever in front of were a couple hundred people at a wedding. And the energy was just electric in that room. Using my skill set to provide value to someone else has opened up doors that I never dreamed could be opened with any amount of money. So here's some quick takeaways that we can pull from Michael's story. So first, I can't help but smile when I think of him because from an outsider's perspective, reaching out to someone like Tony Robbins cold would seem like a complete waste of time, especially since Tony had his own internal videographer team for over 22 years. So why would Tony and his team accept an offer to work with some random 25-year-old kid? Well, as Wayne Gretzky famously said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. If Michael's story is an example of anything, it's the power of asking. Most people fall to the default, you know, this message will never get to the intended person or they'll just say no and why even try. They defeat themselves before they even get started. This reminds me actually of a powerful experience that happened at a conference a few years back. There were probably about 4,000 people in attendance and the organizer decided to make everyone play a game of Simon Says. And as the game kind of went on, people started dropping out until there were only a few people left. And at the end, the organizer asked the crowd, he said, who here was playing full out during the game? And if memory serves me correct, there was less than like 30 people who raised their hand. In full transparency, I wasn't one of those people. I thought playing the game was stupid. However, when I saw that less than 1% of the room ultimately played full out, it made me realize that this is probably a good metaphor for most things in life. No matter how many competitors you have in your space, less than 1%, or let's say for argument's sake, let's say 5% are playing full out and they're really going all in. Meaning that in the context of, of trying to connect with folks who are unreachable, if you're persistent and go the extra mile, it's never crowded. The success of, of your outreach is often in direct proportion to the amount of effort you put into it. I mean, getting your message in front of someone isn't difficult, but getting them emotionally hooked and eliciting a response from them is. And one thing I've learned over the years is that 
people will reward effort. If you send an email to someone with very little research, very little personalization, and an unclear ask, you've done more harm than good. Conversely, if you put a lot of effort by really personalizing your approach, you'll have a much better chance. The second takeaway is social proof. One thing you'll notice that Michael did really well was he worked himself up the food chain. If he reached out to Tony Robbins right away, the chance that Tony and his people would have given him the time of day is highly unlikely. However, after already having an existing portfolio and having done work with people like Tim and Yannick Silver and Richard Branson, he was able to provide social proof that he's worked with other high profile people in the past. And truth be told, after you work with folks like that, I mean, he pretty much has a golden ticket to work with virtually anybody. The third takeaway from Michael's story is the power of leveraging small wins. It's important to note that every single one of his outreaches, the initial offer was to support them with a small project and position it in a way that made the offer irresistible. Once he executed on what he promised and over-delivered, each and every single one of those people used them for larger and larger projects in the future. Michael is a wonderful example of reaching the unreachable because you know, he reached out with a value proposition, provided social proof, and over-delivered on what was promised with no strings attached. The second story that I want to share with you is a friend of mine named Phil Caravaggio. This is an amazing story. Phil was roaming around the internet in 2013 and stumbled across a video on the foundational principles of the economy that completely blew him away. I mean, the man featured in this video was not well known, uh, at least at the time, in the business world. However, he's regarded by many as one of the most successful investors of all time. Phil was enamored with this guy and his brilliance and just scoured the internet to try to find more from him. Unfortunately, he came up with very little except a document buried deep in a Google search. It was a PDF that had the markings of, I guess, a small unfinished book. Phil ended up printing it out and even just a few pages in, he felt that this is one of the most important pieces of business investing literature ever written. So he made it his mission to make this into a book. Not to one day release it to the masses, but simply as a thank you. Eight months later, after working closely with an editor and one of the best book designers in the world with over $70,000 of his own money invested, a beautifully crafted leather-bound book with linen stock and custom illustrations called Principles by Ray Dalio was born. And this didn't stay a pet project for long. If you're, unless you're living under a rock, Principles ultimately got picked up by Shyman and Schuster and hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list last year and was named the number one business book of the year by Amazon. Here's Phil telling a story of how it came to be. Okay, so the story began in 2014. I had through, I don't know, I, I tend to go down Google rabbit holes. And so, and I'll follow my curiosity on a particular subject. So at the time I was thinking about economics and I've always wanted to understand how macroeconomics work, how does money work. So I uh, stumble across a series of things that lead me to this video called How the Economic Machine Works by Ray Dalio. I have no idea who Ray Dalio is at this point. And I watch it and I, within three minutes I'm thinking, this is one of the greatest things I've ever seen. So I'm three minutes into this thing and I start thinking, who is this guy? And then I go, oh my God, I go, and I find a couple links down this Google link to a PDF. So, you know, in Google, it'll sort of square bracket that it's about to take you to a PDF. Mm -hmm. And I look at the URL and it's like www.bwater.com slash file underscore upload slash you know, principles v4.3, blah, uh, you know, dot PDF. Principles. I'm like, what? what is this? And the link is a PDF. Nothing fancy, but it, it's called principles. And I'm like, well, what could that be? But I read it in a, maybe like 10 pages in of this Word document. I'm thinking, this is one of the greatest things I have ever read. So I sit there and I think, this is one for the ages. This has to be a book. So my first thought was, I could do this. I can make it into a book. I got the sense that this was his life's work. Just from reading it from afar, I didn't know him from Adam at the time, but thought, this what he's writing here, this is his life's work. I know the investment is a big part of it, but 
Nobody does this unless they really want to leave a legacy. If they feel like they've learned something. I had self-published a lot of things. Our company had self-published a lot of things in my early days. I could take this and turn this into a book, but not just any book. And turn it into some kind of timeless feeling gift. And I got really excited about this. I'm like, you know what? I, and I think he would like this. He, he's got four sons. He's got, he's got a family. He's obviously writing this. He cares a lot about the people he works with. So I go and I make the book. It took eight months of time. I, I, we thought it would take like four weeks. It took eight months. It cost a shitload of money. I, I, I'm very fortunate the, that I have the means to do this, but it's really not so much about uh, how much went into it, but I think the spirit behind it and the willingness to see these things all the way through. And this is why I think when it comes to like, you know, the reaching the unreachable, I don't think it can be just to reach them. I think there's got to be some higher purpose. Like, you know, there's got to be some reason, some affinity, some common ground, some mutual benefit far above and beyond what what there typically is. I, I think people maybe get scared off by that because they think it's impossible, but I think people are typically too self-deprecating. There often are ways that people can add value. But like for this, it's just it really deserved as a piece of written material to be in a form factor like this. And that's why. I don't think in reaching the unreachable there's ever a guarantee of it working out. I think the only way to do it not the only way to do it. I could say my way to do it, if and when I need to do it, is through acts of genuine generosity. And it has to be genuine, meaning I don't think there can be an expectation on one's part that it will work out. Because then it changes into like calculation. You know, like if I do this, then this will happen. I, genuinely for me, it wasn't that. I'm like, you know what? I think you just, if I were him, I would want this. I have an ability that he doesn't have. If he had it, he probably would already have the book. Maybe I could give that. And maybe if he found value in it, he'd look at a guy like me and say, you know, hey, that maybe that'd be a good investment of time as a mentor. The aftermath of this was really interesting too, because he did actually become a mentor. You know, for the last, well, going on three years, you know, he was very, very kind. And he, he said, you know, I, I, feel deeply indebted to you for this. Like, I, I don't know if I can pay you back for it. So what do you want? You know, I remember when I was in the office with him, he says, he's like, what do you want? You know, I think big, you know, how are we going <laughs> to, I got to pay, you know, do you want to, I don't know, you want tickets that we're going to fly you somewhere. I don't know. What do you want? And I, listen, I don't need and it, What would make me happy is if every so often I run up against a business problem or a problem of some sort and I give you a call and you take the call. That's what would make it great. Done. Deal. You know, and, and he and he lived up to his end of the bargain and then yeah. you know, I was really sorting through difficult issues. So for example, how, how should I take on investors? How should we think through certain problems and whatever? And he would just ask a very interesting selection of questions, you know? Like there are only so many questions one can ask. In business, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. However, what I notice is that people prioritize questions differently. So Ray asked a certain selection of questions and asked them first. And in so doing, we had this really productive conversation. And that's how he mentors, just kind of asking questions and putting it back to the person. And the product of that conversation yielded a product idea that six months later, we were able to bring to market a piece of software that we launched. We made $2 million the first day. I mean, even re-listening to the story, I am grinning just ear to ear. I mean, it really exemplifies something that I share all the time, which is that if you go the extra mile, it's never crowded. So let's break this down. First, Zig Ziglar has a saying that we go from survival to sustainability, sustainability to success, and success to significance. Ray is already uber successful financially. I mean, he currently sits at the top 10 richest self-made men on the planet, according to Forbes, meaning you couldn't buy his time if you wanted to, but the majority of people who attain a certain level of success shift their focus to creating a life of significance, a life that matters. If you could support them with that next chapter, whether that be getting them speaking engagements, building an audience, writing a book, you're a priceless asset to them. The second takeaway to highlight is something else that Zig Ziglar has said, which is, you can get everything you want in life if you will just help enough people get what they want. 
the law of reciprocity is that if someone does something nice for you, you will have a deep-rooted psychological urge to do something nice in return. Now, Phil wasn't aggressively seeking mentorship from Ray, which is a really important thing to highlight. Letting go of expectations and, and self-serving desires is a really important place to start before you do an outreach like this. I mean, people can smell when you only have your own self-interest at heart. And with that said, if you do have self-serving desires, be very clear out of the gate with your goals and intentions. The third principle, I guess you could say, to highlight is another reason why most people defeat themselves before they ever get started is because they can't figure out the how. In this case, Phil, I mean, not only did he not know Ray, but he didn't even know how to get the book into Ray's hands. But again, as Steve Jobs famously said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You just need to trust that they'll somehow connect. One of the best ways to uncover connections that you wouldn't have found otherwise is simply putting it out there to your peer group, which is exactly what Phil did in essence, and that eventually connected him to Ray. A few years back, I volunteered at a retreat that a good friend of mine puts on called Board Meetings, and my buddy's name's Jim Shields. I'll probably feature Jim's work in season four of the Community Made podcast, but Board Meetings, in essence, is a three to four day experience with the core focus of building deeper bonds between entrepreneurs and their children. And during the second day of this retreat, probably kids ages eight to 18, We were walking them through, I guess, a a vision board process. And over the next hour or so, they worked through their vision exercise of of what they wanted their life to look like. And after the kids finished their vision board, everyone gathered together, parents and children, in a room so that the kids could share their boards. One by one, they presented what they wanted their future to look like for them. And I remember some of the kids said, like, I want to start a business in hopes of one day opening an orphanage. Another kid said, I want to start a business so that I can snowboard all day. Uh, And then it came to this girl named Aaliyah. And unlike those that came before her, Aaliyah shared with incredible clarity that she would love to work with a storyboard artist at DreamWorks. And his name was Miko Simmons, who is one of the lead artists. Little did she know at the time, the guy sitting like literally seven feet behind her could actually grant that wish. While listening to her sharing her dream board, he interrupted her and said, I can make that happen. I actually work with DreamWorks and do a behind the scenes tour with them at least once a year. And watching this unfold in front of my eyes reconfirmed something that I've known for years, that if you have a clear what, and more importantly, a very strong why as to why you want it, you don't necessarily have to worry about the how. I mean, you can call it serendipity or the laws of the universe or laws of attraction, regardless what you call it. If you have clarity around what you want and why you want it, as long as you're willing to invest the the effort towards it and share it with your network, the how will often take care of itself in ways you can't even predict. And that finally brings me to the third real life example of reaching the unreachable. This is a story of how I connected with a billionaire named Wilson. Now, Wilson is not his real name. However, I want to err on the side of caution and keep his name private because he's a listener of the podcast. uh, So I don't want this to get weird. Uh, But the reason for my initial outreach to Wilson wasn't for me per se. It was because I wanted to offer the opportunity to meet him as a thank you gift to a lucky MMT alumni for nominating a new member to our community. I mean, basically, we've had just over 16,000 entrepreneurs apply for MMT since our inception in 2013 for a community that's capped at 150 people annually. And that number of applicants can be overwhelming uh, to find the right candidate and can be like finding a, a needle in a haystack. So with that said, I'm a firm believer that amazing people know other amazing people. And our acceptance rate for folks who apply cold on our website in full transparency, is 0.4% versus 92% when someone is nominated through somebody who's already part of our community. Now, nominations are are never financially incentivized. However, as a fun thank you, I thought I would put together a few kind of once-in-a-lifetime experiences. And in this case, going you know on a hike with the founder of a super well-known multi-billion dollar brand. Now, I had no in with Wilson, In no way that I could really deliver value to him on the surface, so I dug around online and discovered that he had a charity. 
I reached out to the president of that said charity and asked if the person in question, I guess you could say, would be interested in offering an hour of his time in exchange for a donation. Later that week, I got the green light and connected with his lovely assistant. And after going back and forth over a few emails, uh, we lined up a date. A few weeks later, after picking our winner, I found myself in the back of a Rolls Royce chauffeured by his driver on the way to his house, which as a side note is one of the most expensive residences in the country. What was set to be a one hour meeting ended up being half a day. And some lessons to extract from this. First, there's a saying that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Well, the way to a wealthy person's heart oftentimes is through their charity and it works like a charm. A friend of mine owns one of the world's most exclusive concierge companies. And it's a company that used to be used as the fulfillment concierge for the American Express Black Card. So the essence of their service is that I mean, they make dreams come true, meaning if you've ever wanted to sing on stage with Journey or take a MiG jet to the the edge of space, you know, they can make it happen. And although a business like that is based on relationships, their most go-to strategy in their playbook when wanting to connect with a celebrity is to connect via their charity. It's by far one of the best ways to buy access. And actually, another friend of mine who has a pretty big podcast platform started to get some really big-name guests all of a sudden, uh, probably about a year or two ago. And I found out later that this was actually the same tactic that he leveraged as well. The second takeaway here is that if you want to influence someone, influence those who already influence them. Let me say that again. If you want to influence someone, influence those who already influence them. So many times people focus on connecting with a big name that they look past those in their inner circle. Now, in this case, it was Wilson's charity, but you can use this the, this principle. I mean, their assistant, their spouse, or even their chauffeur. I often put those in their inner circle on a pedestal far more than the big name themselves. I really focus on building trust and rapport with them because if a billionaire has them around, they are probably worth knowing, right? They're they're probably really interesting. And building rapport is generally significantly easier to do with, with them because others rarely see value in them and often overlook them. So it's a huge mistake and a huge opportunity. For example, it's, it's not uncommon for me to send flowers or a gift of appreciation to someone's assistant after they schedule a meeting for me. A small gesture like that goes a long way and I'm always looking for opportunities to own real estate in both their minds and their heart. Now, a great example of this is speaking events. Now, I've been an attendee at events, I've spoken at events, I've facilitated and put on events. Inevitably, when a speaker steps off the stage, they are swarmed with people vying to pitch them or ask them a question. With that said, they are very rarely at these events alone. And more often than not, I mean, nobody's paying attention to the people that they're with. I mean, people who are generally their assistant or their PR person, or even sometimes their spouse, if it makes sense. Those are the people that I gravitate towards and strike up conversation. I mean, that's the low hanging fruit. The third lesson which is something I didn't touch on in the story, is follow-up. Follow-ups are rarely done, but are super important when it comes to fostering an early-stage relationship. During the time with Wilson, the conversation was 90% him and 10% me because that's how I wanted it to be, ultimately. I talked about this already in Episode 3, which was the event networking guide for introverts, but when it comes to building rapport, in first-time interactions, I always focus on the other person and say very little unless prompted. Studies have shown that if you encourage people to talk about themselves for the majority of a conversation, they will feel a stronger connection than if you let the conversation be 50-50. With that said, in that first interaction, I'm always looking for a genuine reason to follow up. In this case, I discovered that Wilson was a fan of Jimi Hendrix and that he was in the midst of writing a book. And I should point out here, that there's a pattern, right? Successful person wants to write a book. A book is a significance piece. I connected with Shep Gordon initially, who you heard from at the beginning of this episode, by offering to support him with the marketing of his book. And in that book, which was They Called Me Supermensch, he shared a rare, or actually a few rare and untold stories about his time spent with Jimi Hendrix. So I decided to send Wilson a copy of the book along with an LCD card with a video from me explaining that if there was any way for me to support him like I did with Shep, to let me know. Now, some of you may be asking yourself, well, what's an LCD card? Well, there's a saying from a great book called 22 Mutable Laws of Marketing, which is what works in the military works in marketing, and that's the unexpected. 
I could have sent him an email, but he probably gets hundreds of those a day. I could have sent him a letter, but he probably receives hundreds of those a year. An LCD card, on the other hand, I'm almost certain he's probably never seen one before. It's basically a mailer of sorts that looks like a brochure, but when you open it, there's a seven inch screen that you can preload and personalize a video in it. They're not expensive. They have a little bit of a minimum that you need to buy, but again, it's a great way to stand out. So again, what works in the military works in marketing, and that's the unexpected. And trust me, when you're trying to reach someone who's a big name, in those first time interactions, you're marketing ultimately, right? You're, you're trying to sell why you're worth or worthy of their time and attention. So how can you stand out in that outreach? So just to recap, these are three great stories showcasing how to reach the unreachable. We talked about the power of asking and why most people defeat themselves before they even start, the importance of social proof and working up the food chain, leveraging small wins and making your initial offer irresistible, how if you can help someone shift from success to significance, you can become a priceless asset to them, the law of reciprocity and that you can get everything you want in life if you will just help enough people get what they want. The importance of letting go of expectations and self-serving desires. While you can't connect the dots looking forward and the importance of putting out your desires to your network. Also the importance of playing full out and going the extra mile. And if you want to build influence with someone, influence those who already influence them along with the, the importance of building rapport with their inner circle. And finally, the importance of the follow-up. Now, I have a lot more examples and a lot more strategies that I can share. However, as mentioned earlier, every outreach is different because of context and personalization. But hopefully these examples will help you craft a strategy of your own. As a fun side bonus in the community made group, I'm going to be sharing two things that may prove to be really helpful. I mean, first are real scripts of some initial outreaches that I've done. And second are tools on how to find virtually anyone's email address. I'm, I'm sharing these in the community via screen recording because they're a little hard to explain verbally on the podcast. So if you're not a member of the community made group, it's free. Simply visit communitymade.com to join. Now, so far I've shared examples of best case scenarios, I guess you could say, stories of successfully reaching out to the unreachable. But what happens when things don't work out so well? Let's talk about worst case scenarios. What should you do if you get no response, a rejection, or make a bad first impression? First, let's tackle no response. Um, did they receive the email? Did they not like it? Did they forget to reply? That unknown can be a killer. Not receiving a response is oftentimes worse than receiving one. And thankfully, there are a lot of tools out there that help you track when emails are open. A tool that I currently use for Gmail is called Mixmax. So that's M-I-X-M-A-X. -X. Uh, but there are a ton of others out there. But if you can confirm that an email has been open, there are two strategies you can use to engage afterwards. First is to restructure the email and provide a little more information. Generally, in my first, I guess, email outreach, I'll say something along the lines of, if this opportunity is of interest, please let me know and I can follow up with some additional details. Positioning the initial email in such a way where you're not showing all your cards gives you the ability to shoot a second or a third email and provide a little additional information each time. Something, again, I'll, I'll, I'll share in the resource section of the community made group. But if I can't add additional details to my email for any reason, I'll simply resend the email. And it's important to note that I won't forward the email. This is, I've been the, on the recipient side of this before. And forwarded emails to me almost come across a little passive aggressive and a little pushy. What I'll do is I'll, I'll simply copy and paste into a brand new email and coming from someone who receives a couple hundred emails in a single day, it's easy to forget to reply or it's easy to get lost in the clutter. So don't assume that because they didn't reply that they weren't interested. So those are some ways to tackle no response. Let's, let's talk about dealing with, I guess, a rejection. Now, a response, even if it's a no, is a win in my books. If, if you plan for it and even expect it, you can turn it into an opportunity. My belief is that you should have a response to virtually every objection in advance. I mean, doing so will help you strategize and position your initial outreach to ensure that it's airtight. If you are reaching out to someone to be an advisor for your company or you know, how would you deal with the following objections if they said, unfortunately, I'm not focusing 
you know, my energy on startups at the moment, or what makes your product or service different from XYZ or your competitors, or how did you get my email address to begin with, right? Having a, a strategy to, to these objections will help you greatly when crafting, again, that initial outreach. You can never be too prepared. Most people give up, again, when they receive a no, but there's a rule of thumb in door-to-door -door sales that I heard a long time ago, which is that the sale often happens on the fourth door, and 95% of the salespeople give up on the third. So don't give up. A friend of mine named Ned was trying to wear, I was trying to work with a particular company a few years back, and he kept on getting a no. And his response to me was was classic. He was in the plumbing business, and he said, I'm going to keep calling and either she's going to give me a yes or her current supplier won't be able to do the job and they're going to need to say yes or she will end up dying of old age and the person after her will say yes. I mean, you don't necessarily need to be that relentless, but it really illustrates the point. The mere fact that you received a response means that you just started a discussion and you're one step closer to a yes. With that said, how you reply is obviously case by case. But there's two things to keep in mind, and both of these are gold. First, never take no from someone who can't give you a yes. It's so easy to get shut down by gatekeepers and give up. But again, never take a no from someone who can't give you a yes. You'll hear in the next episode with Shep where I talked about how initially I was getting turned down left, right, and center by his lovely assistant, Nancy. But I didn't give up, and ultimately that turned into a beautiful relationship. The second tactic I learned actually from a good friend of mine named Craig Morantz, and it works like a charm. When someone says no to your initial request, reply with, under what circumstances would you say yes? Or under what circumstances could we make this work? The success that I've had from posing this question has been astounding. I mean, the reason it works so well is because it puts the onus on the other person to clarify what a yes would look like. And oftentimes the difference between a yes and a no is a ridiculously small concession. If your initial request is to go for lunch with someone and they say no, oftentimes you don't know the true reasoning behind the response. Maybe they're busy on that certain day that you suggested, or maybe they're in a time crunch because of other, other projects. So when you put the question back on them, you put them in the driver's seat ultimately to design what a yes would look like, you'll often be surprised with what they come back with. So that's a few ways to deal with no replies and rejections. Now let's talk about bombing first impressions. I was at a speaking event in Vegas two years ago and Gary Vaynerchuk was the keynote. Now, if you're not familiar with Gary, he's a very well-known and well-respected entrepreneur and tech investor who's garnered millions and millions of fans and followers across virtually every big social media platform you can think of. And in the business space, I mean, he, he's definitely someone that people strive to connect or associate themselves with. Now, on two separate occasions during Gary's 60-minute keynote talk at the event, these guys rush the stage in order to take a selfie with him. And being one of the closing speakers that, at that event, I felt like it was a great opportunity to address firsthand why this approach was problematic if you actually want to build a genuine relationship with Gary. I shared that when asking you to take a selfie with someone, what you're articulating, whether you're conscious of it or not, is that you're not on the same level. You're putting them on a pedestal and you will never be able to build a reciprocal long-term relationship from that position. Let me frame it this way. And there's truth. I mean, this is a true statement that has validity to it from a, both a, a biological and evolutionary perspective. We are all self-interested. I mean, our ancestral environment consisted of limited resources and fierce competition, right? So self-interest comes naturally. People want to connect and associate themselves with assets and allies in order to move forward their own agendas. I remember watching an episode of Friends many, many years ago when I was a kid, and there was uh, two characters, Joey and Phoebe, and they got into this debate that there's no such thing as a selfless good deed and that everything we do on some level is for our own happiness. And it's easy to discredit this notion and sit on some moral high ground, but we're all designed to think in this fashion. It's deeply ingrained in us. At our core, our basic primal purpose as humans is to thrive long enough to procreate, right? I mean, finding a, a greater meaning for our lives and happiness is far down the ladder of, of priorities. It's kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And like any living organism, our goal is to thrive 
and at a minimum kind of stay alive. Now, yes, we are communal on some level as humans. However, we are communal for the simple reason that we have a much better chance of surviving by banding together in, in numbers than being on our own. We are all self-seeking. Now, this is not black and white. This doesn't mean that there's 7 billion narcissists roaming the earth, but, and we obviously care about other people, but ultimately we are designed to be self-seeking. With that said, human beings tend to seek out relationships that they believe will be beneficial with people who we think are going to add some kind of value to our lives. For thousands of years, humans have been selecting mates based on physical fitness and reproductive viability. The idea that human beings are attracted to and seek out relationships with mates that have certain traits that we see are as desirable is called mate value theory by evolutionary biologists. I mean, healthy, strong mates are seen as having a high value because their ability to produce healthy, strong offspring. And although it functions a little differently in contemporary society, this is hardwired in the human psyche. Sociologists have adopted something like this to understand how we select our relationships. There, there's these relational value theories that, that suggest we, we select mates based on whether or not they have character traits that we believe will result in higher quality relationships. So, for instance, the idea that we can choose mates that are more supportive or understanding and independent, ambitious, because these traits will lead to healthy relationships versus potential mates who are unkind judgmental, codependent, and so on. So social exchange theory proposes that we measure the value of the relationship using a cost-benefit analysis that weighs what we put into it versus what we get out of it. So we seek out relationships with people that we believe will offer us the most reward for the least amount of effort, and the benefits may be social, they may be economic, and they may even be emotional. All of these theories have one thing in common, and that's the idea that if you want to connect with someone, if you're looking to develop and maintain a relationship with them, you have to have something to offer. With that said, ultimately, when you reach out to someone, they're asking themselves two questions, consciously or unconsciously. Can I trust you? And can I respect you? Psychologists refer to these dimensions as warmth and competence, and ideally you want to be perceived as having both. These two questions are covered extensively in Harvard Business School professor Amy Cuddy's book called Presence. Cuddy says that most people believe that competence is the most important factor, but in fact, warmth and trustworthiness is the most important factor in how people evaluate you. From an evolutionary perspective, she says, it is more crucial to our survival to know whether a person deserves our trust. While competence is highly valued, she says that it is evaluated only after trust is established. This is foundational, and nobody who preaches networking gospel in the marketplace touches on anything close to this. It reminds me of a philosophy that a friend of mine has. His name is Ryan Holiday, which is, if you have a crappy product with great marketing, all great marketing will do is make people discover the fact that you have a crappy product faster than they would otherwise. You can have all the best tools, the tactics, and strategies in the world when it comes to networking, but if you don't come across as trustworthy or you aren't perceived as an asset to an individual you're trying to connect with, good luck. I mean, one of the most common questions that I receive in the context of business relationships is, Jason, how do you connect with blank? Right? You can fill in that blank with whatever name you desire. It could be Elon Musk, Tim Ferriss, Richard Branson. And I always throw back at them and say, you know, if you want to connect with Elon Musk or a Tim Ferriss or Richard Branson, what would make them want to connect with you? Ultimately, would you want to be friends with you? Another way to frame it is, if your life were a book, would you read it? If the answer is no, this is a great opportunity to start building a better story. I always say that you don't need to be famous, but you need to be either promising, as in someone worth investing in, or fascinating on some level. And fascinating doesn't have to be a game of apples to apples. I have a friend of mine who has traveled to 126 countries. I can sit him at a dinner table with movie stars, millionaires, doesn't matter. I mean, the fact that he's been to 126 countries, I mean, he's fascinating to almost anyone. So what makes you fascinating? It's a hard question to answer, and it's okay to say nothing, but one of the best places to start is to assess where you are. A great way to do this is a personal balance sheet. Now, as entrepreneurs, we, we do balance sheets for our business, you know, mapping out our assets, our debts, our liabilities. 
And a personal balance sheet kind of goes along the same principle. What, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? How can you be of service to others? Now, you may want to elicit the help of a friend or two to help you go through this exercise, as we often have a hard time identifying our strengths because we're too close to it. Or sometimes, if you're someone like me, you're probably a little hard on yourself. And as a quick side note, for those of you who are hard on yourselves, one frame of mind that has helped me navigate the praise that I get externally versus the lack of confidence or belief that I have internally is that you're never as good as they say you are. And you're never as bad as you think you are. You're probably somewhere in between. But but let's get back to the topic. Get very clear on your strengths or your unique abilities versus your weaknesses or your areas of ignorance. I mean, Warren Buffett famously tries to eliminate one area of ignorance from his life every year, and I've adopted the same principle on some level. With that said, once you've identified your areas of weakness, work on them enough so that they don't get you into trouble, and then focus your energy on doubling down on your strengths. As I was once told, if you spend your life working on your weaknesses, you'll die with a whole lot of strong weaknesses. Or as Peter Drucker famously said, a person can only perform from strength, one does not build performance on weakness. This exercise is ultimately all about self-awareness. Now, there's a balance here. You, you want to build a better story. You want to constantly make yourself more interesting, but not at the expense of portraying something you're not. I've done a lot of personal development in one form and another for the last 14 years. I've done Date with Destiny, multiple UPWs with Tony Robbins. I've done programs with Landmark, retreats with Philip McKernan, hundreds of hours with therapists. And most recently started dabbling with psychedelics. I, I share this only because personal development is so powerful, especially how it shows up in your relationships. Personal development in my eyes isn't so much about becoming anything, it's about unbecoming everything that isn't really you. So be you, be unapologetically yourself, because as my friend Taki Moore would say, your vibe attracts your tribe. Be authentic. The notion of fake it till you'll make it is, is BS, with the exception of stepping into your alter ego, which I made mention of in the last episode, but authenticity is the alignment of your head, your mouth, your heart and feet, thinking, saying, feeling, and doing the same thing consistently. I mean, this builds trust and you can't build trust by faking who you are. And be vulnerable. If you don't have the courage to be vulnerable at times, you'll never be able to reach a real level of depth when it comes to your relationships. If you don't share your struggles, people won't buy your successes. Vulnerability is the key to deep connections. And be transparent. My buddy Michael Fishman always told me that credibility can be established with credentials or being transparent that you have no credentials. Never underestimate the value of transparency. In an era where people inflate their titles and experiences on LinkedIn, humility and transparency is refreshing. And the final thing is be so good they can't ignore you. To quote Sheryl Sandberg, we need to stop telling young people, get a mentor and you will excel. Instead, we need to tell them, excel and you will get a mentor. I play the long game when it comes to relationships. It's not as sexy, but as mentioned before, it's really hard to recover from you putting yourself or putting somebody on a pedestal on a first impression. I wanna be seen as a peer. I wanna be seen as an asset. I wanna be seen as, a, as an ally, not as a groupie. And the only way to do that is to lean into my own greatness and not rush relationships. And this really hit me where in 2011, I was at that event that I've shared several times now, where on the stage, there were some really big name folks and I didn't even feel worthy enough to be in the audience. My struggle with low self-worth at the time kept me from meeting anybody. And in hindsight, it worked out in my favor because it's better to make no impression than a bad first impression. And I mean, I would have put these people on pedestals. And again, that's, a, that's starting a relationship from a position of weakness. But over time, I started to make a name for myself. I started to be known in their community. And many people who were on that stage in 2011, seven years ago, have become dear friends. I've, I've vacationed with some of them. I've, I've gone to their weddings. I've spoken at their events. They've flown me in for interviews. All this because I chose to play the long game and focus my energy on being so good that they could ignore me versus vying for their attention early on. Remember that Gary Vaynerchuk story I made mention of at the beginning of this episode where we spoke at the same event and people ran on stage to take selfies? Well, I didn't know Gary at the time. We were in similar kind of social circles and we've seen each other in passing, but we've never shared a word. And on the VIP evening after his talk, which was before my talk, 
I was sitting at the back of the room with two of the other speakers, and Gary ended up walking in. And one of the speakers to my right whispered in my ear that she was going to get up and go take a photo with him with the expectation that I would join her. And even though part of me, full transparency, felt pulled to do the same, I knew that it was a poor choice for a first-time interaction. Again, you'd be better off making no impression than a bad first impression. So I sat back while she walked over to him. And a few minutes later, while the conference organizer was speaking on stage, Gary stood right by the table to listen. And after a minute or two, he glanced over at me, extended his right hand and said, hey man, I'm Gary. Fast forward a few months later, he was a surprise guest at MMT. That is the long game. That is how you build genuine relationships. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for listening. As mentioned in the middle of this episode, in the Community Made group, I'm going to share two things that may prove to be helpful. First are real scripts of some initial outreaches that I've done. And the second are some tools that you can use to find virtually anyone's email address. I'm sharing these in a Community Made group uh, via screen recording because it's, it's hard to explain verbally on the podcast. So if you're not a member of the Community Made group, it's free. Simply visit communitymade.com to join. And as a second quick side note for fun, I decided to take some some of the concepts shared uh, in this season of how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships and go deeper with an intimate group of folks in a live workshop setting and uh, announce the first workshop sold out. So we're doing a second one. So for dates and availability on that, visit superconnectorworkshop.com. That's superconnectorworkshop.com. If you enjoyed this episode, nothing would make me happier than hearing your thoughts or biggest takeaways. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at Jason Gaynard. That's J-A-Y-S-O-N-G-A-I-G-N-A-R-D. Or email me directly at Jason at CommunityMade.com. Before I go, i got to give a little bit of a shout out to Ryan France from London, Ontario for leaving the following review on Facebook. He said, I've been following Jason's podcast since he started the MMT podcast way back when. I was really pleased to see the Community Made podcast pop up on my radar last year. The episodes never disappoint. I'm a huge believer in the motto that self-made is a myth. The roundtable with Altucher and AJ Jacobs was a really good listen, especially for someone who is working on curating interview and audience building skills. Ryan, my man, I'm one of your biggest fans, dude. You are a very early supporter, uh, again, of my work and the last podcast specifically. So thank you for the rating and the review. For the rest of you out there, if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast and like what we're doing here at Community Made, I would be forever grateful if you would share this podcast with your friends or leave an honest review on either iTunes or Facebook, just like Ryan did. Join me for the next episode of Community Made, where I share an intimate interview that I did with the legendary Shep Gordon at our most recent MMT. And when I would sign an artist, that was always my first thing. Give me a dream. Let me make that, let me manifest that dream. And then you'll know what I do for a living. In that conversation, we dig deeper into how we became friends using a lot of the principles mentioned in this episode. I'll see you on the next episode. Enjoy your week.